got a guest speaker today. This is all we're doing. The guest speaker. I know you guys are working hard, probably studying, right? So I didn't want to keep you all three hours. I think, you know, he's going to teach you. This is probably going to be enough for this topic, which is malware. So I'm going to let me read his bio. It's Tom Quinlan, and topic today is the malware challenge. Uh, Tom has more than 27 years of experience. Can you believe that? He only looks like he's like 20 years old. Uh, 14 professionally with technology, with extensive experience in network and application security, electronic discovery, digital forensics, and malware analysis. So really, a perfect candidate to talk to this program, right? Given that it's mostly digital forensics. He has held positions at several technology companies in charge of large-scale e-discovery projects, forensics investigations, and network and application security for some of the internet's largest online applications. He is certified in computer security. He's a CISP, digital forensics, he's an case certified, and malware reverse engineering, RIM. I never heard of that. It's the first one. Yeah. Oh, that's the yeah. SANS one. I always have trouble with those SANS ones. Sans. He serves as a member of the editorial advisory panel for Linux Journal and has been featured as a guest on IMI Tech Talk Radio discussing digital forensics and electronic discovery. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom and he's going to presentation on power now. Thanks, Tom. Good evening, everyone. Um, so if I get this correct, everybody gets to go home after I stop speaking? Yes. Okay. But don't feel like you have to rush. No, I won't rush. But, um, I actually just finished the program myself at Johns Hopkins, so I understand exactly where you are right now. And hopefully I will not rush, but I won't hold you too long either. So uh, we'll cover the important stuff. So we're going to talk about the malware challenge today. Um, this is going to be our outline, and if you have questions along the way, please feel free to ask. So I'm going to talk about investigations, malware, the current challenge, how things are right now, um, the characteristics of malware authors, um, which are quite interesting types of malware analysis, and then how things are done currently, and then where it's going in the near future. So, in my professional career, these are the categories of investigative cases that I've been using. Um, the first one, technical assistance, for those of you who are in forensics, that pretty much comes down to recovering data from dead hard drives. Um, you'd be surprised, especially early in your career, how often you get to do that. As soon as people find out that you have forensics experience, the next thing they're asking you to do is recover data. Forensics is very similar, obviously, the difference being that it's towards the purpose of actually finishing an investigation. And then electronic discovery is actually a subset of forensics in which you are collecting data, not necessarily in a forensically sound manner in the same way you would for forensics, but that's typically to support one or both sides of the lawsuit. Incident response and malware analysis I make the differentiation here between whether or not the actor is known. Um, I find that it helps with classification for when you're doing things professionally, but that's not necessarily a scientific differentiation, and sometimes the lines blur because if you have an incident where you already know who it is, then it can be a, a little sketchy in terms of the actual definition. Okay, so what is malware? Um, pretty much the definition is right there. Any software whose ultimate actions interfere with the normal operation of an information system intentionally or otherwise. And the otherwise port is important because it can be accidental. It doesn't have to be someone attacking your network. It can be someone who releases really crappy code. Um, that happens quite a bit. It's a very broad definition, but it's that way on purpose. But if we look at that definition, we do have to ask these questions here. How do we define an information system? How do we define software? And then, is it a problem to have such a broad definition? For the most part, it's not. Um, your definition of information system can actually get quite broad, too, depending on um, where you look. Essentially, DNA can be considered an information system. So the broader you get, the more interesting things get, especially when you're talking about malware. So the types of malware. You're probably already familiar with most of these terms. Um, Actually, the ones on the left you should already have heard about. The ones on the right, I know you have heard about, at least the second one, because it was just on your test. Spear phishing emails, those are quite common these days. That's actually a large um, amount of the things that I was investigating. Denial of service and distributed denial of service, that's relatively familiar to people. And then the last two are quite interesting. I didn't actually know these until I actually put this presentation together. Um, it seems that people are essentially taking the word phishing and then adding on prefixes so that you get smishing and vishing. <laughs> smishing is SMS phishing, which means you're sending targeted attacks over SMS. And then vishing is a voice over IP phishing. So 
don't really know what they're going to think of next, but it's to be quite interesting. All right, so the current challenge with malware. As you can see at the top, there are 80,000 new variants of malware every day. That's not a month, that's not a year, it's every day. Um, I technically work for an antivirus company now. They analyze about 50,000 samples in a day. They have an internal record of analyzing 90,000 samples in a day. And we'll cover how they do that later because obviously there's not people sitting there analyzing one by one. Um, but you have malware that gets more and more sophisticated as time goes on. It exploits multiple vulnerabilities. It can spread in numerous ways. Um, the most common way, of course, being Microsoft file sharing. But you can spread malware just about any way you can think of. Um, USB devices have come back into fashion, especially with Stuxnet, which obviously, as you know, is the product of our government. Uh, and then obviously, with advanced persistent threats, things are getting very specific. Malware used to be, I'm going to spread my malware as far as possible. I'm going to try and get as much as possible done without knowing what my target is like. But these days, things are very sophisticated and people are targeting <coughs> specific individuals at specific companies for specific purposes. And then the last point is that one of the big challenges, and I guess you guys are helping to solve that challenge, is that there's a real shortage of talent in this area. Um, it's actually quite difficult to hire people in this arena. Um, having a forensics background, having a computer background in addition to forensics, and then having the ability to, say, read assembly code or to do advanced malware analysis is a very specific skill set, and it's very difficult to hire for it. So the good news is when you're done with the program, you guys should all be able to find jobs, no question. If you don't already have them. All right, so. I stole this particular slide from one of our marketing decks at work, but I think it actually does speak to the problem as it exists now. So at the beginning, worms and viruses, this only goes back to 2004, but I think the first worm, the Morris worm was uh, released in, what was it? 88. 88, yep. So 1980, I was 13 at the time. So, um, but nowadays you can see that um, things are getting more sophisticated and they're becoming more and more of a problem for large organizations. And that compounds with the fact that you can't really hire in this area because people are faced with more and more of a problem and less and less of a resource to be able to deal with. So it used to be that back in the day you just had script kiddies type stuff where people would release a worm, see what it did, Melissa virus, I love you virus, that sort of stuff. Nowadays, or I should say recently, it's more spyware type stuff with uh, criminal organizations essentially trying to control large amounts of computers to be able to do uh, denial of service attacks, send out mass amounts of spam, that sort of stuff. But more recently, obviously, is advanced persistent threats. And again, like I said, very specific. Down to the individual level, down to the individual computer level. When you have an advanced persistent threat, the person behind it can often tell you more about your computing infrastructure than the actual person using the computer. That stuff is kind of scary. The way they hide these things is just unbelievable. So we'll cover that too. <coughs> okay, I'm guessing there's a build here. Yes, all right. So that's not built on my computer like that, but basically, this is again um, more of what I was just talking about. Things are getting more complex. In the past, you could get by with antivirus and firewall, you were pretty much good at that point. That is no longer the case today. Today you have to have um, things tied into your network so that you know what's going on. Um, a lot of people to this day still don't have egress filtering. They don't know what's leaving their network. And that's actually a really good way to determine whether or not something is occurring on your network. So the people who get in are going to get in. You're basically never going to stop them in certain cases. But a really important way to determine what they're doing is to filter your outgoing traffic. Because if you can filter your outgoing traffic, then you can identify when things are leaving your network that shouldn't be. And there are ways around that, obviously. If you um, encrypt the traffic as it goes out, if you send that out over port 443, for instance, which is the HTTPS port, uh, if it's encrypted before it leaves, then you're not going to see it. Um, that is actually quite common today, but there are ways around that as well. Um, but as it gets more and more specific, people have to have a more and more specific tool set and nowadays, we're looking at forensics tools like NCASE, FTK, um, 
HP Dairy Responder Pro, that sort of stuff. You have to be able to analyze hard disks. You have to be able to analyze memory, and you have to be able to analyze network traffic. And a large portion of the problem that comes from that is that there's just so much data to look at. It's literally gigs and gigs and gigs, possibly terabytes of data in a large organization at any one time. So, okay. So why would you analyze malware? Like I said, uh, keeps you well employed. Suspicious events are occurring in your network. You can respond to them, but most times these days people will want to be proactive. Um, you're never going to get certain parties out of your network, and that's part of the reason they're called advanced persistent threats. And then what happens then is you're essentially mitigating what they can do. You're not removing them wholesale, because invariably they're still there in other places. And if you remove them wholesale, you're also tipping them off that you know that they're there. And sometimes that's not the best way to go. Sometimes you want to find out what it is they're, they're doing and why they're doing it. Because figuring out who they're going after, what they're going after, is almost as important as getting them out of their time. You have assets you need to protect. One of the biggest reasons for advanced persistent threats these days, uh, especially in university environments and defense contractor environments and the like, is to protect intellectual property. Um, nation states tend to want to skip ahead in their technology development, so most of the time what they'll do is they will essentially hack into the defense infrastructure of an opposing country. If you don't have an F-22 in your arsenal and you don't want to spend 10 or 12 years developing one, then the easiest thing to do is to download the plans from Lockheed Martin. Why would you spend all that money and time researching it when you can get fully developed plans and just build the thing yourself? That goes on quite a lot. And then intelligence and attribution, again, as I mentioned, it's important to determine who is attacking you and why. Um, Lockheed Martin, to use a fictional example, would want to know that the F-22 plans, for instance, are being stolen. Um, they want to be able to protect those plans. They might want to essentially create false ones and put them in a place that can easily be hacked or easily be hacked, so that they're essentially planting false evidence so that they can throw whoever off. All right, malware authors, though, are not stupid. They're quite smart. They are lazy. Um, you'd be surprised just how lazy some of these people are. They don't want to be caught, obviously. Most criminals don't want to be caught. And then they want the most bang for the buck. So they're going to try and get as much as possible out of these particular systems with as little effort as possible. Oftentimes, being smart and lazy will actually help with that, so it can be very useful. So, if we look at what they're facing, the initial state, as I mentioned in the previous slide, was essentially antivirus type stuff. These are now an acceptable minimum. These are things that you can't not have these days because they will take care of the vast majority of the minimum type stuff, the stuff that you're going to deal with every day, the stuff for which you already know exists. So if we look at what an antivirus signature does, um, essentially it's looking for a predetermined pattern. You guys probably already know a lot of this, but I'll cover it pretty quickly. Um, I'm using the example of Clam Antivirus here because Clam Antivirus is actually an open source antivirus tool. And you can actually download the source code, you can look at how the signatures are created, you can create your own signatures. Um, so here we have three types that they have. The simple one is just hex signature of the actual malware itself. This has limited use, obviously, because if the signature, or I should say the actual file changes, then it won't change. <coughs> they have extended ones where you're actually doing um, a little bit more. You have a hex signature and then an offset. So if you were to pack a particular sample, um, then you can get the unpacked version and the offset to determine whether a particular sample is actually uh, that particular one. Can you define packing? Because I haven't oh, talked to them. Sure. Um, essentially, when you have an executable file, an executable is just compiled code. Um, files that are compiled can be reversed, they're reverse engineered. Uh, it's not always an exact science, but you can essentially get back the machine code that the machine uses from the executable. And what packing does is it essentially rewrites the section headers of an executable file and kind of obfuscates the rest of the file. So it's kind of like it's zipping it up. Um, oftentimes compression is used. But when you pack a file, when you examine the file on disk, all you're going to see is the section headers and then a lot of garbage. Um, 
So it can be encrypted, uh, obfuscated, zipped, or all three. So it makes the job of reversing a particular file very difficult. When you want to reverse a file like that, typically you have to run the file into the RAM of the machine because obviously <coughs> in the RAM you can't have an encrypted file. It has to be able to read the file in RAM to be able to use it. Um, so when you do that, what happens with the packing software is that the packing software will actually um, know where the offset of a particular executable actually starts and it will hide that, but when it reads it into memory, it then has to reveal the offset so that it can actually unencrypt or unpack the actual executable. Um, so the extended will actually look for a particular offset and the particular hex signature. But again, this is problematic because uh, if the hex signature doesn't match exactly, or if the offset is even slightly off, uh, again, you're not going to detect. Now there are also logical uh, signatures, which are a little bit more complicated to create because now you have to start doing math and logical operations. So, but it still essentially relies on the same stuff as the previous one, but now you have the target description block, which is essentially more information about the header of the file. And then you have logical expressions where you can also have sub-signatures, so you have sub-sig 0, sub-sig 1. And what that means is that you essentially have either extended or simple signatures, and you're doing logical operations against <coughs> those sub-signatures. This is obviously a lot more complex, but it actually gives you the ability to do more complex matching. So if the offset is off by a little bit, for instance, then you can do a logical operation that says, OK, look for the offset here or here, or if it's greater than a certain number, look here, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's actually um, the way things are done. And if we look at an example,